Welcome to Casual Friday. I want to start off by updating you on uh, my latest completed spinning project and also my latest completed knitting project. Then I'm going to answer some questions. Some are brief questions with fairly brief answers and one of them is quite in depth. It has to do with set in sleeves and working them uh, in a top down short row uh, fashion rather than bottom up and flat. It's been just over a month, I believe, or maybe a little bit more than a month since I learned, I took my first spinning class and um, I've completed a few different yarns and, you know, haven't been happy with them, you know, I get, I get progressively better, which I'm happy about, but I haven't, I hadn't completed any a yarn that I would actually want to knit with, either because there wasn't a sufficient quantity or just because it's so uneven that I just, as a knitter, I wouldn't want to knit with it. But this yarn that I completed is, I'm very happy with. I'm not sure exactly how much I have, somewhere between 150 and 200 yards is what I'm guessing. So um, this, is the, this is the first fiber that I bought myself aside from the Corydale that I bought when I bought my spindle just to learn a little bit about how to how to um, spin fiber just as an introduction before my spinning class uh, and that I didn't choose the fiber it was if she's like well here we have this Corydale and I picked a color so in my class they supplied us with fiber and it, which is great because uh, then they could kind of lead us through how to use these different fibers for different purposes but a week after i bought my spinning wheel i went uh, to a shop and i bought some fiber myself i bought four ounces of a wool silk blend i spun three bobbins three separate bobbins and then i used my own spinning wheel for the first time to ply because previously when I did plying I did it on the Lendrum that the Weaver's Guild had in the classroom. So this was my first time plying on on my own machine and it was um, it was really fun. It was interesting. I'm really happy. Um, this is still a little damp. I washed it yesterday morning. It's not quite dry yet. So I'm going to give it another day or so and then I'll try knitting something with it. So hopefully next week I can show you how the knitted fabric turned out from this yarn. So this is my very first yarn that I did on the spindle and this, this is the singles that I had that went with them. They're pretty thick and thin and the yarn was very big. This is the second yarn I did and this was a two ply and these are the singles that I used to make this yarn and again it's very <laughs> erratic. This is the yarn that I showed a couple of weeks ago where I had a problem with my um, how I was winding on while I was plying and then I pulled it out and re pulled everything in and I got a better result on this side than this side. And then this is the yarn that I just completed that's a three ply yarn. And you know, it's not perfect, but it's much more uh, consistent than any yarn I've previously done. Now, one of the things that, I, that I've learned and I don't know, <laughs> it's one of these things where I've learned and it sort of makes sense, but I don't really understand it. I don't, I don't know enough about why yet is that for whatever reason, when you are first spinning singles on the spinning wheel, the, the singles have a lot of energy is what they say. And then if you let it sit for a day, which I guess you're supposed to before you ply, I'm not really clear on that, um, that it will have less energy somehow. And I don't really understand this. I'm going to have to read up on this some more, but uh, that is something that happens. So I'm not really sure how that affects the finished yarn when you're plying the, the singles together. I don't, I don't understand that. But, um, another thing that I've learned that makes sense to me and I, it makes sense to me and I'm not really sure if I, if I'm right about why it makes sense. 
but I was emailing back and forth with my friend Ole Petter, who lives in Sweden. He's the one who's, whose voice I heard in my head when I realized I had to learn to spin because he had been kind of uh, nudging me. One of the things he said to me recently when I was talking about I was going to be plying this yarn was that it's a good idea to, um, to take the singles that you've spun onto a bobbin and then wind them off onto a different bobbin so that when you begin plying, you're plying from the same end where, that you originally spun, started when you were spinning the singles. So that keeps the direction of the spin, I guess, in terms of the, if it's like the grain of the wool or whatever it is, whatever it is, it's sort of the direction in which you were spinning the singles that you ply in that same direction. And he said, well, some spinning wheels are set up so that you can wind off of your wheel onto uh, another bobbin. And I kind of played around with that with mine and I'm like, that mine does not do that. Well, I, my spinning wheel came with four spools and I knew I was going to need more and I hadn't bought any yet. But in the meantime, I was trying to figure out how am I going to, am I gonna just not uh, worry about winding things off. I didn't wind, want to wind them off using my ball winder and a, like a toilet roll in the center because that's how I have been plying and it, it would give me the result that I wanted except that then I would be, I'd have these toilet rolls sitting on the Lazy Kate. I wouldn't, they wouldn't have this kind of um, flat part at the bottom and so then what they do is they slide off the, the toilet roll and they wind around at the, on the, the, spike on the lazy k and i just didn't want that i wanted them to be on a bobbin so i was thinking about well how can you do how could i do this how could i transfer from one bobbin to another and i was thinking you know it's too bad there isn't some way to use a drill <laughs> somehow to do that or like an electric mixer you know people are always using using tools like that that can rotate in order to do yarn related things so i was thinking about it so i don't know a week or so ago i I was thinking about that. I'm like, there's gotta be some kind of bobbin winder or something. So I, I started Googling and I found this product, I guess you'd call it, called Bobbins Up. And what it is, it's storage bobbins. It's these plastic bobbins and they have a whorl at one end so that that you can use them on your lazy kate with a tension string on it so they'll they'll wind around there some lazy kates have that and mine does and it prevents them from from spinning in one direction and then starting to spin in the other when you're applying so so you you get every for every bobbin that you buy you get this little spike thing and what this does this is like a drill bit so it fits into your drill this part does and then you put it onto the bobbin and then you run your your drill and it will wind it'll wind on to the new bobbin off of the old one so i did that i thought it was really cool and um worked really well and i ordered eight of them they were like five bucks a piece or something so i have eight storage bobbins which leaves me with four of my uh, lendrum wooden um, bobbins that I can spin on on my wheel. Oh, I wanted to ask for anybody who is a spinner out there. I saw a book mentioned online. It came out earlier this year and it seemed like it might be um, a useful type of book for someone in my position where I'm, I've, I'm past the very beginning stage of spinning, but I haven't tried a lot of different things. And the book is called 51, 51 yarns to spin, something something like that. And it's by J.C. Boggs, as of the woman who publishes Ply Magazine. And, and it's not clear to me how useful it is. And I, and I looked, the textile center doesn't have it, so I couldn't look at it first. I mean, I would buy it if it looked good, but I just, I wanted to get a look at it first. So if anybody has, has, has that book and has tried it, and if you tell me what you think of it, I'd really appreciate it. So the next thing I want to tell you about is my finished knitting project. It's, this is the sweater that uh, I, I knit for my daughter and um, it's completed. And I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I was going to be doing, I was gonna try a couple of different things with the top-down set-in sleeve with short rows. I had a couple of different ideas in mind. And 
so I had two, two different things I wanted to try and it turned out that the first method was perfect and it was what I thought the second method was going to do. I realized my second idea was wrong. So I only did the first one and it worked out really well. It's, um, it's sort of a tweak of a tweak of the original method that Barbara Walker came up with in her book, Knitting from the Top Down. So I'm going to later in the video explain a little bit about set in sleeves in general and then about top down set in sleeves that are done with short rows and the and sort of the um the easiest formula the more refined formula and then the actual tweaks i did to perfect the the set in sleeve for my sweater because for me that is really the key to getting a, a great finished garment is that standard easy formulas are easy and they're, they're easy to remember they're easy to execute they don't always give the best results and so every time you tweak something um, to refine it a little bit more you get a better result so there's a continuum of what knitters are going to want or be willing to do for themselves or figure out for themselves or um or even know how to approach. So I thought I'd talk about that a little bit later in the video. So now I wanna answer some questions and respond to some comments that have been made in various videos in the past of mine in the past couple of weeks and as well as in the Rocks Rocks group, because I thought they were good questions, good comments, and they deserved a wider audience than maybe would happen to see them. So the first question was on this week's Technique Tuesday video where I talked about the three general categories of color work. So if you didn't see that video, I'll link to it at the top. But uh, in the general categories are uh, stripes, color block, and alternating colors. Stripes don't actually have to be stripes. It's, it's the technique where you're only working with one color in any particular pass across the stitches. You might be slipping some, you might be doing all kinds of things, but you're only using one color at a time. The color block method is intarsia, where you can have multiple colors in a row, but uh, when, you are you, when you switch from one color to another, the old color, that yarn is left hanging and it isn't used again for the rest of the row. So sometimes you can have 30 or 40 different color changes in a row if it's a really complex pattern and there is a separate ball for each one of those. And then the last category is alternating yarns where you're using two or more yarns in a row and you're, all, you're carrying them all the time. All of the, all of the colors in that row around are being carried at the same time and you use one of them at a time. So you're alternating between them. So stranded color work is the obvious um, technique that or the obvious situation in which you'd use that kind of a technique. So the question was where would double knitting and two color brioche fit within those three categories? So I knew right off the bat that well for double knitting there's there's two different ways that you can do double knitting. One is to use one color at a time and slip the stitches that you're not working and and then work the stitches in that you are working in a single color and then go back to the beginning of that row and use the other color and go back across. So that would fall into the sort of the stripes category in terms because you're only using one color at, at a time when you're making a pass. But there is a different technique for doing uh, double knitting and that is um, when you're alternating colors. You're, you're using both colors at the same time and you alternate between which color you're using. And uh, so, so you could, that could fall in either one. Now, two color brioche is not something I've done. I've seen it. I haven't watched anyone do it. I, with regular brioche, it's not, it's not a technique that I uh, am crazy about doing. I find it a little tedious. Um, I think it's beautiful. I think it creates beautiful fabric, squishy fabric. I love the results. I just don't enjoy knitting it. So I have never even looked at two color brioche. So I went and I looked at a few videos to even see how it was done. And the videos I was seeing, they were, it was one of these two pass things where you use one color 
and you work the technique in every other color while you slip the alternate colors. So you go back to the beginning and then use the other colors. So that's like the first method of double knitting that I was talking about where it sort of falls in the stripes category because you're only using one color at a time. Um, at, but I looked at that and I thought, well, this is an awful lot like double knitting. So somebody probably has come up with a method for doing, uh, for carrying both colors at the same time. And so, so I looked for that and I found one. There was a video by Sock Matician and he normally, uh, I guess, does a lot of double knitting. So he used his double knitting know-how to figure out how to do two color brioche while carrying both colors at the same time. And he does a very nice job. He shows one, in each, uh, one yarn in each hand, and then he also demonstrates, well, if you carry both yarns in, one, in the left hand or both yarns in the right hand. So it's a really thorough video, and I thought, he was, I thought it was well done. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, you could check that out. But Again, so each of those of those color work um, families could be placed in in either one of those general color work technique groups, depending on uh, which one you chose to use. Another uh, question that came up in that video had to do with the use of bobbins, um, and I assume she's talking about using them with intarsia. She she. She didn't specify intarsia, but that's the only place that I would ever use bobbins or that they would ever be needed. And she was talking about, you know, they're commonly used in crochet and maybe some other kind of needlework. And she wondered why no one ever talks about it in knitting. And I thought, well, of course they do, because that's where I learned about them was from, you know, reading books and, and before the Internet. So I don't know, she wondered if that was something that just wasn't done in knitting and that's absolutely not the case. Um, I would say that there are alternatives to having a separate bobbin for each color. Bobbins are a way, so you could use a piece of cardboard and you're just winding yarn around it. So you're creating a smaller ball and it's dangling from the back of the work. And what happens is if you have a lot of colors that you're working with in Tarsha, they tend to be hanging and swinging around each other and then they get tangled. And so you have to untangle them. So that's one of the, the things about intarsia that can be kind of a pain. And people come up with all sorts of ways of where they, they put them in some sort of a box container with a hole in it to keep them um, separated. And it's never clear to me how they do that because you have to link the colors when you switch. So maybe then they, they unlink them the other way. I don't, I, that's never been clear to me. People come up with ways of doing it. So my method is to figure out how many yards of a particular color I need for a particular block. So, and the way I do that is I count up the number of stitches in that block in that color and I use my stitch gauge to figure out, well, if they were all knit in one row, how long would that be? And then I multiply by three. So let's say I, so let's say I'm working at five stitches an inch and I have a um, hundred stitches in some block of color. So five stitches an inch into a hundred stitches, that's 20 inches. It would be 20 inches wide. And you need three times that much yarn in order to knit something 20 inches wide. You need 60 inches worth of yarn plus some yarn tail. So I might pull out two yards. I would measure the, the yarn tail from my nose to end. That's one yard, two yards. And then I would make, instead of wrapping it around a bobbin, I either just let it hang or I might make a butterfly, like a center pull butterfly and let it hang. Um, one of those two things. So that's typically how I deal with intarsia. If I'm using 100% wool that's not super wash, I don't worry about it too much. I just measure off a couple of yards. And then if I need more, I spit splice one end to the other. Can't do the spit splicing if you're working with a super wash or non-wool um, type of fiber. But that's how I get around it because I just find bobbins to be annoying to me. But they're not they're not considered bad form to use. It's just you find what works for you. And if that works for you, then then you do it. Okay, so the next question was somebody wanted to know whether the yarn quantity given in a pattern, like if you're making a sweater and it says in this size you need this much yarn, whether that includes enough yarn to work the swatch because she's, she says she feels nervous about it. If you need 1,500 yards of something and the yarn you're using has 200 yards per ball, you have to use the eight balls of it, so you're going to have extra anyway. 
usually designers, especially with sweaters, they're rounding up. So if it's going to be super close, like if it's really close, they might just start going up to the next full skein uh, for that size just to be safe. So there, generally there should be enough uh, yarn in the requirements to include the swatch. But if there's not, then you just take your swatch out. When you run out of yarn, then you undo your swatch and you just knit from that. And uh, it's fine, you can always reuse the yarn. It might be kinky um, as you're knitting and it'll look a little weird as you're knitting, but as you wash and, and uh, block it, if you use warm water, not cold water, but you use warm water to help relax the yarn, uh, it should block right out. I, I had to take apart a couple of uh, little projects that I knit with some yarn uh, at one point when I had a sweater that was in hibernation and I had been using the yarn not realizing that yarn was for a sweater. And, um, and so I ended up you know, taking apart a, a whole baby sweater and then some other little project as well and knitting an entire sleeve with it. And it was pretty kinky. The first time I washed and blocked it, it didn't work out very well. And so I, I soaked it again in, in much warmer water. Then it relaxed. And now I don't even know which sleeve it was. You can't tell. So, so use your swatch if you're worried about it. Just wait until the end and use it. Oh, one of the things that I do, I've talked about this before, I do spreadsheets where I calculate the total number of stitches in a project. I go through all the shaping row by row um, and calculate the total number of stitches. So one of the things that I do is I keep track of where I am in the project when I finish each skein. And so I can get a good idea uh, about how many stitches each full skein is going to um, supply and then I can tell if I'm, going to, if I'm going to run into issues toward the end. So that's another option. If that's something you're willing to do, not, I would think most people are probably not willing to calculate the entire uh, number of stitches in a project, but uh, I do. And the last question is about cabling. Somebody noticed that I do like to do a lot of cabled fabrics and they wondered what, whether I use a cable needle and if I do, what sort of cable needle I use. And the answer is it depends on whether I'm knitting English or if I'm knitting continental. For the first you know, 20 years or so as a knitter, I was an English knitter, so I was throwing the yarn, but I had a very specific way of knitting English. Let me get a, a needle. I think I may have shown this before, but. Okay, so here's, can you even see this? this is, I have a, this is a 14 inch needle. So this is the type of needle that I would have knit with the first 20 years or so. 14 inch needles, I love those long needles. And I would anchor this needle at the junction of my hip and thigh. So this is just pointing straight up. I'm not holding the needle, I'm touching it. With my left hand, so all the stitches would be hanging on the left. So I would have this hanging up in my left hand and I didn't insert my right hand needle through the stitch on the left hand needle. That right hand needle was pointing up and perpendicular and I would mount the stitches onto that needle. So, and I still do that now when I, um, when I knit Continental, it took me a long time to realize that I did that. I would tell my students insert the needle and I would be going, <laughs> insert, I would be mounting the stitches. I'm just so used to ha having my right hand still and moving my left hand. Um, but that's just how I knit and I keep the needles perpendicular. So when I was knitting English, I preferred a short straight needle. Let me go, um, I should have brought this over here. So when I learned to knit in Ireland and then I was, you know, home for a year and then I was in New Zealand, when I got a cable needle, I got these, they were always short like this. They were four inch straight metal. They were just like my knitting needles, only they were shorter and they were perfectly straight. I did have some of those bird wing type and I never liked them. Be and because I'm self-taught, I don't think I'd ever watched anybody else cable. So I just figured out on my own how to cable. And what I would do is I would take the cable needle, I'd put it in there and then I would hold the two needles parallel to each other. I don't know if you can see. So they would just have one finger in between it. So the cable needle might be in front, might be in back, but 
but I just had a finger in between the two of them and I held them parallel and then I would just mount the you know the stitch from whichever needle I was going to be knitting if it was on off the regular the nut left needle or if it's off the cable needle I'd, I'd knit it off and then I'd go off the other one and it was not any slower really than just knitting the only thing that slowed me down slightly was catching two stitches or three stitches slipping them off and then and I mean that was it was a very brief maneuver I, I didn't know <laughs> I never liked the other kinds of cable needles like the U or J shape and I didn't really care for the bird wing because they interfered with that I'm like how if this is like it's oh it's ridiculous because I didn't know that people slipped uh, the stitches onto the cable needle and then just dropped it and let it hang it never occurred to me so and I'm like, well, why would you do that? It's so slow, it hangs and you gotta pick it up and then you gotta, you know, it just seems so slow to me. So, um, so I didn't, I never found it slow to cable with a cable needle, especially a straight one. If I'm doing something that's really bulky or really loose, um, I will use a double, uh, just a regular double pointed needle. I might use like a one that's quite long. Uh, just depends on how thick the yarn is, how wide the cables are. Um, but when I was knitting with the yarn in my right hand, I used a little cable needle like that. When I started doing uh, traveling cables, where the, you have two knit stitches crossing, two knits or two purls, and you have them um, every right side row, they'd be crossing. You'd have multiple ropes and they'd be moving back and forth. Then I started to see how cabling without a cable needle might work better, but I still, with two stitches, I was using a cable needle. It was when I started going into like the traveling twisted stitch patterns where you have one stitch over one stitch. So you're, you're doing a lot of crossings in a given row or round and they're happening every round. So then the idea of doing cabling without a cable needle made sense to me. But otherwise I felt that it took longer than using a cable needle when I held the yarn in my right hand. When I started to really commit to uh, working uh, knitting in Continental, that's when <laughs> I the cable needle became a problem for me. And that was because I was doing like the the one by one cable crosses, sometimes with knits and, and like a knit crossing a purl, so I'd have to move the yarn forward or back. So I had that going on. I, I had the, um, both needles, the cable needle and the left hand needle in my left hand, plus I was dealing with the yarn and then move, and it was too much. It was like too much stuff getting in the way. And that's when I saw the value of cabling without a cable needle. Now, many people who hold the yarn in the right hand cable without a cable needle. Um, but I, because of the way that I was cabling, it was not more efficient for me to do it that way. It is more efficient for me to cable without a cable needle when I am uh, knitting Continental, which is most of what I do now. And most of the types of cables that I do now are one by one or two by two. Very rarely do I do a wider cable. And when I do, I am more likely to use a cable needle, which doesn't slow me down that much because the crossings are much less frequent than they are with one by one or two by two. So now I want to talk about set-in sleeves and for this I think it's going to be mostly overhead. If I think I need to come back to the face-to-face -face, um, then I will but I think it's going to mostly be overhead. So this sleeve cap was knit, the sleeve was knit bottom up and the decreases along the edge uh, the shaping formed these the de line of decreases which acted like another rib. What I like about working a set-in sleeve cap flat is that you can get this line of parallel stitches along the seaming edge. So the seam here was done in this column of purl stitches and this was the the line of decreases. So you get this kind of uh, parallel action going on with the edge of the sleeve cap and then with the body. So this is the sweater, the sweater that I just finished where I picked up stitches around the armhole and then I worked short row shaping to form the sleeve cap. So I still have that same sort of, of shaping going on. I have the sleeve cap shaping but I don't have that sort of parallel uh, edge along the sleeve cap that 
that kind of marries the two pieces together. So it looks fine. It looks, you know, perfectly okay. It's just, it's just a little detail that I really like uh, in the bottom up flat armholes. Otherwise, the shaping is exactly the same. So I want to compare the different sort of formulas or methods for calculating the shaping for a sleeve cap. Now you can do, you can use certain formulas to calculate things really precisely, but there are some ways that you can do it um, that, that are a little easy, maybe a little bit easier. The idea behind a set in sleeve is that you have a sweater body where you have bound off some stitches at the, at the underarm. And then usually there's some little um, decreases right here to form this little curve. And then you work straight up to the shoulders like that. So you have an armhole depth. This armhole is a certain depth, but the actual circumference of the armhole is larger than just doubling the depth because you have these bind off stitches and a little bit of some curvature here. But if you, if you measure from the bind off at the armhole to the bind off at the shoulder, you'll have a certain depth. The sleeve is shaped so it's narrow at the cuff. And then you work, in, if you're working bottom up, you're working increases every few rows until you reach the maximum width that you want. So this is going to be equal to the circumference that you want for your sleeve around your upper arm or bicep area. So it's going to be, whatever your, your arm circumference is, plus the amount of ease that you want. And then again, you're going to bind off some stitches right here, the same number of stitches that you bound off over here for the underarm. You're gonna bind off the same amount. Usually that's about an inch. Um, so usually this would be about an inch and then the decreases here would be about another inch. You'd lose about another inches worth of stitches so that the, shoulder width is about four inches narrower than the body width it but it really varies depending on the size of the person but that's that would be typical so then you have this sleeve cap that comes up here and it's shaped more or less like this so this length right here this edge right here is needs to be the exact same length as the armhole is from here, so at, after the bind off part, from here up to the top. So plus back down again. So whatever this is doubled is the same as this is. So this is this curve that's fitting your shoulder and upper arm. It's filling in the part of the sleeve uh, right, right about here. And so you need more length here than you need down here. So how do you figure out this shape? Well, the simplest method, if you're working bottom up, the simplest method is to use a couple of standard formulas. One is however many stitches you have here, you're going to, you're going to uh, decrease at each edge of every right side row until you are down to a third of your stitches. So a third of the stitches that you had after you bound off. And so you just decrease every right side row at each edge until you have one third of the stitches left and then you bind off. And you get sort of a shape that's like that. The problem is that the proportion isn't always right. This might end up um, not actually the right length, like these three measurements right here may not actually match up with what you need around the armhole. But that's a very simple way of doing it. And it's easy to remember, it's easy to just do. It doesn't always fit well. So you can refine that by instead looking at how wide this one third measurement is and, and you know, subtracting it from the, the total um, measurement of the armhole depth. And then you figure out, well, how much length is left? So how many rows do I actually need to make up that difference? And then that's how many rows you would work for this part. 
and you'd have to figure out what the decrease rate is on that in order to get the right number of rows. So you might be decreasing every right side row for a while, and then toward the top, you might be decreasing every row. So on the right side rows and side, wrong side rows. And that would get you something that looks a little bit more like that for your sleeve cap shaping. So it's a little, little bit better. Well, then you can refine it even more by taking that one third measurement and just doing a sixth of it and then doing some other bind off rows uh, at the very top to give you that full one third. So you get a little bit more rounded at the top because that's what your arm is more likely to be. So you end up with a couple of inches right at the top and then you work another um, inch or so in each direction to give you that kind of curve at the top rather than having say five inches of, of um, straight away at the very top. So you can refine that and then again you figure out well how many do you need to decrease um, in order to get that that total number of rows. So that's that's sort of a refinement approach to the bottom up shaping. So for top down, when you're doing short rows, the idea is, let's say this is your armhole. If you imagine that sleeve cap that you have right here, and you know how many stitches you need to make up that width, so you have your total width, is maybe 16 inches and you have an inch from either side that's that that would be a bind off or a cast on if you're working in the other direction. So let's say you had 14 inches worth of stitches here. Well the idea with the short row shaping is that you pick up one for one along the bind off edge. However many stitches would be in here is how many stitches you pick up around that whole armhole on the body. And frequently this is not going to be the regular uh, rate that you would pick up if you were picking up along a vertical edge and you wanted to knit in, in that direction. You might be picking up one stitch for every two rows. It's, it's rarely a two for three or three for four ratio. So these stitches can be a little bit spaced out. But the idea is you pick up however many you have so you pick up all the way in the round, and then again, you have that one third business at the top. So you would work your a first short row that's very long, starting from here all the way around here. And then you turn back and so that you have this one third stitches at the top there. And then the idea that the way Barbara Walker originally described it was that you'd work in short rows back and forth, just going one stitch more every time, all the way back, back, back and forth, back and forth until you get down to these, um, to the last stitch before those uh, straightaway bind off cast on edges are. What this does is it produces the same exact shaping that you had in this very easy formula where you were decreasing every right side row until you had a third left. Instead, you're, you're, you start with a third of the stitches and you are adding one short row every time. It's the same rate. So you get something that's the same, basically the same shape that you would have had in this situation. So the refinement to that, that someone came up with, is that you work this one third, you work that first long short row here so that you've got a third of the stitches, you place your markers here, and then you divide up the remaining stitches on here into thirds. And you round, in this first section, you round to the nearest three multiple of three stitches and then what's ever left you divide in these two sections with, so let's, let's, let's have an example. Let's say you have uh, 22 stitches from here to here. So the near, so that would be seven stitches divided into each of these thirds, but the nearest multiple of three 
would be six stitches for that. So then uh, you can make this eight, and that's the nearest multiple of two, and then this is seven. So you're short rowing three stitches every time for this section, and then short rowing plus two each time for this section, and then for the final, final section you, you add one more stitch to your short rows every time. So that's, that's one refinement. But that you know still leaves quite a wide um, span of stitches here at the top. So what I like to do is I like to instead have just a couple of inches at the top. So you could do that one third divided, you could just say this is one sixth instead, which is often what I do, one sixth of the stitches here, and then divide this result into threes. So that's a, a, a multiple of three, multiple of two, multiple of one, and these are just ones. So the result of something like this is a little bit more like this result where you have stretched out that third a little bit wider and then you can get your twos and then your ones. So the sweater I did for my daughter, this is the original bottom up shaping. This is what it was and there were every every right side row for a while I was to do decreases and then every row for a while decreases and then there were several rows of bind off three and then that final um, bind off 12 in the, in the middle. So for this sleeve, 24 stitches was about the a third of the stitches and so only 12 of them were at the very top and then the other 12 were spread out with these um, three stitch bind offs. So what I wanted to do is create a, a bottom or a top down shape that was very similar to that. So this is the Barbara Walker shaping. So this is be like if I came I, I worked across the all of the stitches and uh, so they had that middle third and then worked back and forth. This This is 48 rows long this sleeve cap. This sleeve cap uses that one third in the center and then divides up the rest of the stitches so that I can do a third of them in short rows that are three stitches longer and then a third of them where short rows are two stitches longer and then the last third that was one. So this one creates a pretty wide flat a cap that's only 32 rows long. And then this is the cap that I came up with where I use my refined method where I only have a sixth of the stitches at the very top, I divide the remainders up into three and do uh, short rows that are three stitches longer each time and then two stitches longer each time and then one stitch. And I ended up with something that was 39 rows long. Well, if I look at what my original sleeve cap was, that was 40 rows long. So it's the same, it really is the same shape. You can look, you can, uh, they, they really do come out the same. So, so that was the one I went with because I, I did kind of want the same exact shaping if I could get it. Well, that's it for this week. Again, if you have questions or comments, it doesn't even have, it doesn't have to be something that would require a full video. If you just have a question about how I do things and maybe why I do them that way, feel free to leave those down in the comments below or over in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.